Today's message is entitled, Relational Insights. I don't know if you know it or not, but God is a relational God. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. And it shows you just how relational they are. When Jesus was on the cross and the Father had to separate himself from Jesus because he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. That separation caused Jesus to cry out, why have thou forsaken me? The separation. He had never been separated in any form and fashion from the Father. God is a relational God. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, after a while, God told Adam to go, Adam, and you know, name all the different animals. And when Adam named all of the different animals, Adam recognized the fact that he himself was alone. And God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so he made him a mate. God is a relational God. And so God is concerned about you. He's concerned about your relations. The Bible tells us this. If you have your notes, write this scripture down. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Everything... That was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Let me read that again. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. For everything, not some things, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance, as encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Lord our God wants us to have hope. Even in this life that's full of ups and downs and twists and turns and all types of controversy, the Lord wants us to have hope. He wants us to have hope again in our homes, in our families, in our marriage, in our relationship. He wants us to have hope. And we're going to see this and we're going to talk about all of this in today's study. And so let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We pick up our systematic studies right there in verse 8. And it reads, To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. If there is any brother who has a wife who is an unbeliever as she consents to live with him, He should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Let's stop right there if we will. Let me have your attention. And let's rightly divide the word of truth. Now, the first thing that we need to know about what we're looking at here is we have some do's and don'ts in regards to our relationship with the Lord and also our relationship with each other. Some do's and some don'ts. As we said here, everything that was written was written for our benefit. It was written so that we could have hope. And in this life, we need hope. Amen? Amen. And our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with each other, we need hope. And so these things, again, were written to give us just that. Now, 
in this passage of Scripture, our writer, the Apostle Paul, is addressing three different groups of people. And here's why it's important that we understand that. And that is because if we do not understand who he's talking to, then we really can't understand what he's talking about. See, if we don't understand he's talking to three different groups of people, we would just take what's being said here and we'll lump it all together. And therefore, we won't receive from it what the Lord wants us to receive. See, understand something. There are times when the Lord God speaks generously or generally to us all. But then there are times when he speaks specifically to us. It's just like in our home. It's like in our family, just like with our own children. Sometimes we're like, kids, where are you? And there's a general call. But then there's other times like you. I'm speaking directly to you. And so when it comes to the word of God, it's very, very important that we know who's talking, who's he talking to, and what is he talking about? People come to me many times and say, well, how do I read the Bible? How do I study the Bible? And I tell them, you cannot jump from place to place to place to place to place because you'll never understand anything. A lot of people do that. They read over here today and the next day they just open up the Bible and they read over here and they read over here and they're going, I don't understand anything. You'll never understand anything like that because the Bible is actually 66 different separate books written over a 1500 year period of time on three different or three different continents by 40 different writers. But it all fits together. But you have to start at a certain place and go through it. And so when we understand the fact that our writer here is talking to three different people, then we can say, okay, well, where do I fit at in that group of people? So the three different groups of people are these. The first group of people is he's talking to the unmarried. And what he means by unmarried in that passage of scripture is he's talking to those who are widows, or widowers, or he's talking to somebody who at some point in time in their life who've had some type of sexual intimacy, but yet they are not married. So he has specific orders, specific instructions for that group. The second group of people he's talking to is he's talking to those who are married and where both parties in the marriage are Christians. Talking to those who are married, but both people in the marriage are Christians. And the third group of people that he's talking to are those who are married, but where one person in the marriage is a Christian and the other person is not a Christian. Now, watch this and let's break these things down. In verses 8 and 9, He speaks to those who are unmarried and he tells them it is good for them to remain single. And why? We talked about this in last week's study. Why? Because it's easier to serve God in a single state than it is to serve God in a married state. See, in a single state, you can pretty much come and go like you want to. If you want to get up or you want to stay out for two or three days or whatever, you can do that. If you want to go to the other side of the world or do something, you can do that. But guess what? When you're married, you can't do that. As we talked about in last week's study, when you're married, you got to check in. You have to check in on a regular basis. Amen. Married people, where are you? What are you doing? Are you lost? You forgot where you live at? You have to check in. Also, when you're married, you have to spend a lot of time pleasing and honoring your mate. Because if you don't, you won't have a mate for long. Amen? Now, I've been a pastor for a long time. But there's something that I've never, ever, ever heard. Since I've been a pastor. And that is somebody comes up, somebody walks up to me and says, Pastor, I need to talk to you. 
I got some stuff that's going on in, in, in my marriage, and, you know, can I talk to you? Can I, can I, can I set up a time and, and come down and just and share? Because this, this, this is just driving me crazy. And I'll go, okay, for sure, you know, come on in. You know, we, we, we'll talk. And they come in and say, Pastor, here's the deal. My mate, Pastor, my mate, they just, they love me too much. <laughs> They're just driving me crazy, Pastor. Every time I turn around, they're buying me this and and they're buying me that and they're taking me here and they're taking me there. They're just showing me so much attention. They just shower me all with all of this goodness. And pastor, I just can't take it. (laughs) Never heard that one before. I've heard plenty of people come in, pastor, they're getting on my last nerve. They don't buy me anything. They don't take me anywhere. He doesn't talk. She talked too much. You hear that kind of stuff all of the time. But in all of these years as a pastor, I've never heard anybody come in going, they just love me too much, I can't take it. Never heard that. But again, my point is this. It's easier to serve God in a single state than it is in a married state. But as we also talked about in last week's study, is if you don't have the gift of celibacy, then you can't stay in that single state. If you're sitting there, brothers, and you got the remote, and you're channel surfing, and all of a sudden you look up and you see the Jetsons, and you're going, oh, I remember watching the Jetsons when I was a little boy. Yeah, yeah. And you're watching the Jetsons, and you're going down memory lane, and all of a sudden you start thinking, Dang, that Judy Jetson so is fine. <laughs> man, look at Judy, man. She got that little ponytail. She just be bopping around. Man, Judy fine. Boy, that girl's some kind of fine. Brother, it's time for you to find a wife. <laughs> Ladies, if you're sitting there and you're watching TV, you're channel surfing or whatever, and you look up and you go, man, look at that dude right there. That Mr. Clean. <laughs> that brother buffed. And then he cleaned the house too? <laughs> Sister, it's time for you to find a husband. But again, Paul is saying to those who, again, who are not married, Again, they are widow, they're a widower, or again, they've had some type of sexual intimacy over the years. He's saying, guys, for you, it's better for you to remain single. That way you can serve the Lord more. But again, if you do not have that gift, then you need to go ahead and get married because it's better to marry than to burn in passion. Amen? Now, in verses 10 and 11, He speaks to those who are married where both the husband and the wife are believers. He says to them, look again, if you will, at verse 10. He says to the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Stop there if you will. There's several things that's going on in there. First thing I want you to see, the first thing we must understand is that when Paul gives the charge, when he says, I say to you, but then he turns around and says, but not I, but the Lord What he is doing is he's making it obviously clear to the people, to the writers, and hopefully to us, that what he is saying is something that Jesus himself spoke on. See, there are many, many things that the Lord spoke on, but then there were some things that he didn't speak on. And so on this particular subject, when it came to believers getting divorced, Jesus had already spoken on that. See, we talked about this in last week's study, and that is that one of the things that was going on in the church was you had these different people coming up with these different ideas about spirituality. 
And this one group of people came up with the idea that the highest height or the highest form of spirituality was to not be married and not to engage in any type of, of sexual behavior. And so you had some people in the church going, man, well, I want to be all that I could be in God. I want to go to the highest height. And so if that's the case, then maybe I need to go ahead and divorce my husband. Oh, I need to go ahead and divorce my wife. To which Paul says, no way. I say, not I, but the Lord says, a husband and wife should not divorce. Now, hold your place right there. We're going to come back there and turn over to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to look at what the Lord Jesus had to say about all of that. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 6, it says, And the Pharisees came to him, talking about to Jesus, and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read? So what is he doing? He's taking them back to the word of God, that he who created them from the beginning made the male and female, and said, Therefore a man should leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce? And to send her away. He said to them, because of your hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And so the Lord says, yes, it's okay sometimes for Christians to get a divorce, but only for marital unfaithfulness, only for marital infidelity. Now, even in that, it doesn't mean that because those type of issues come up in a marriage that you automatically have to divorce. Again, understand that is not the heart of God. God is a relational God. God wants us to, you know, be able to, to work with each other and encourage each other. But as you know, as human beings, sometimes life happens. Amen. Life happens, things happen, and sometimes, again, you know, things come into the marriage, and one thing leads to another thing, and sometimes, again, there's infidelity. But even in the infidelity, the heart of the Lord is, go and work it out. Go and talk about these things. Go and be reconciled. But God also knows that sometimes the pain of the infidelity. He also knows that sometimes because of the mistrust of the infidelity that you just can't get it back together. You know, sometimes that pain is just so, so deep. And, and especially if it's happened a couple of different times, I've sat down with people, you know, where it's happened a couple of different times and the man or the woman, they want to forgive. They really do. And they're trying, but they just say, my heart is just so Every time they walk out of the door, I don't know where they're going. I can't, I can't trust anymore. And they're trying, but then sometimes it just, it just doesn't work. And the Lord God understands that. He knows that. And so, again, when it comes down to infidelity, the Lord says, again, please go and try to work through these issues. Go and try to be reconciled. Do all things as unto the Lord. But again, he knows our hearts. So sometimes you just have to say, you know what? Okay, you can go. You're free to go. Now, when it comes to separation, there's a lot of different reasons why people separate. 
Sometimes people separate because, again, just, you know, sometimes in a marriage, man, there is mental and, and verbal and even physical abuse. Sometimes, again, a person is just mentally beat down and they just can't take it, they can't take it anymore. Sometimes it's a physical beat down and they can't take it anymore. So, again, there are reasons to, to separate. Sometimes, again, even in a marriage like that, sometimes people, you know, they're married, but they're still holding on to their single life. Holding on to that single life to the point of saying, you know what, ever since I've been 25 years old, every year I get me a new car. And so I'm getting me a new car, and I don't care what you have to say. And the other partner's going, you talking about buying a new car? You just had a new car last year. The kids need braces. I don't care about that. I'm getting me a new car. I've been doing this all of this time, and that's what I'm doing. Or they say, you know what? Me and my boys, me and my girls, ever since we were in college, we take two weeks every summer and we go on a road trip. And so me and my girls, me and my boys, we hitting the road. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Bye. And you're going, but wait a minute, wait a minute. How are you going to do that? Again, we got the kids here. Girl, you know I don't know how to cook. What am I supposed to do with them? That's your problem. And sometimes people hold on to their, to their, to their single life to the degree that it really brings damage to the, to the marriage or the relationship. Other times, it's simply because one party might say, you know what? My daddy was a drinker, and I'm a drinker, and I'm going to keep on drinking. And they're taking all of the money that's supposed to be coming to the household and to the family, and they're drinking it up or they're smoking it up. And so there's a lot of different reasons why sometimes there's separation in the marriage. But when it comes to divorce in the eyesight of God, when it comes to divorce between Christians, God said there's only one legit reason for a divorce, and that is infidelity. That is unfaithfulness, and here's why. Think about it. He says, and the two shall become one flesh. But when you bring a third party into that, now there's separation. And so the marriage bond has been broken. See, the marriage bond is not only spiritual, it's also physical. And when you bring somebody else in there, you've broken that bond. And so God says the only acceptable reason for divorce amongst Christians is infidelity. Now, we'll go ahead and turn back, if you will, to uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 12 through 15, he speaks to those who are married, but where one person is a believer and the other one is not a believer. To them, he says, look, if you will, at verse 12. And to the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife? Whether you will save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife. Again, stop there. There's several different things that's going in there. Again, we have to break these things down. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. First thing I want you to see, first thing I want you to notice once again is the words, I. Now Paul says, I say, not the Lord. And what he's saying by that is this. What I'm about to say to you is something, again, the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, he did not personally address. 
See, again, when you go on through the Bible, again, there's a lot of issues that the Lord does not address. The Lord is not trying to address everything or every situation about every situation. He's given us enough information to carry on in what he's trying to tell us. Like, for example, you go in the book of Genesis. It talks about Adam and Eve, and it, it talks about their sons. And then it says when Cain slew Abel, and then he was being ostracized, he says these other people over there will find me and kill me. Now, if you're anything like me, when I first read it, I'm going, who are these people? Where did they all come from? we got some explaining to do. Again, God does not give every detail about every detail. He gives us enough information about what he's talking about to follow. And so what Paul is saying here is this. Jesus did not address this situation when he was here on the earth. And here's why Jesus did not address the situation between a non-believer and a believer being married and separated. Here's why. Why? Because according to Jewish law, that would never happen. According to the Jewish faith, Jewish people were only uh, allowed to or were only supposed to marry another Jewish believer. And even if you had a Jewish mate and your Jewish mate says, you know what? I don't want to follow the Lord anymore. I'm going about my business. Then Jewish law said that you were to put them away. That's why, as we talked about in last week's study, what happened to Paul's wife? She could have died, but she also could have said, oh, you're not walking in the faith of our fathers anymore. You're going to follow this new Christian thing. I'm out. We're divorcing. And so according to Jewish law, that was the case. So Jesus never addressed that because the people that he's dealing with are basically Jewish. There's very few people when you go through the scriptures where you see Jesus dealing with somebody who wasn't a Jew. And when Jesus spoke, he's speaking to crowds of Jewish people. So the subject never came up. But again, in the Jewish faith, Jews married Jews. And guess what? That's how it is now with us as Christians. The Bible tells us this and write this scripture down. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And that passage of Scripture says, Do not yoke yourselves together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Right, so as believers again, You know, we are to only marry believers. And why? Because, again, God is a relational God. I don't know if you know it or not, but the Bible here, this is God's love letter to us. But this is also God's instruction book to us. And when we follow the instructions, we're better off for it. But you know how it is as human beings. Many times we don't want to follow the instructions. Amen? Amen. We're in the car and we'll put in the address or whatever in Siri or the GPS tell us to go this way. I don't want to go that way. I'm going this way. No, 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 no. Recalibrate, recalibrate, make make a legal U-turn, make a legal U-turn. No, I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. And all, and gentlemen, you know this especially when your wife brings you that bicycle or your wife brings you that box and say, baby, put this together. Here's the instructions. I don't need no instructions. I'm a man. And you look up and you get finished in your bookshelf and looking like the Leaning Tower Pisa. And you got extra parts and you don't know where they came from. That's how it is with our lives. I hope you understand that. The Lord loves us. He did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everything that was written was written for our benefit so that we could have hope. 
And so the Lord says, you're in this type of relationship. Here's the rules for that type of relationship. And when you follow these rules, man, you guys are going to be blessed for following this. It's not to hold you down. It's not to make you bitter. It's to make you better. When you're in this type of relationship, the Lord says, this is how you are to conduct yourself. This is how you are to handle yourself. That's why we come here, and that's why we do what we do here at Calvary Chapel. Again, we go through the scriptures. We teach you the Bible. We don't teach from the Bible, but we teach you the Bible so that when these different situations come up in life, you can say, oh, I know how to handle that. This is what the Lord says about that. I don't have to go and ask, you know, my mother's mother's friends, cousin, auntie, sister's brother about this. This is what the word of God says. And when you take the word of God and you let it be a a light unto your pathway and a lamp unto your feet, man, you don't stumble. You don't get hurt as much. Amen. And so, again, the instructions here, again, for us as Christians, again, we are to only marry Christians. And a lot of Christians understand that. But then yet I see many times where they turn around and date somebody Who's not a Christian? It's like, well, what's the purpose of that? Christians don't just date to date. We date, look for a mate. And if they don't have the right credentials, why are you, why are you bothering with that? Oh, well, they, they're a nice person, and they, they, they got this going on, and they got that going on. And sometimes we end up roping ourselves in to a relationship that God already said from the very beginning that we shouldn't be in. And then when it goes sour, who do we blame? God. God, you, why, why'd you let me get involved with that? God. So again, the instructions. Now, when it comes to, and check this out, this is Paul's, uh, the second thing I want you to notice what Paul says. Paul says again that When you're in a relationship with a person or you're married to a person who is not a believer, that the believer should not divorce their unbelieving mate just because they are unbeliever. See, what happened in the Corinthian church is still what happens today. And that is that there are a lot of people who get married, but then later on in the marriage, one person becomes a believer. I know a lot of people who did that. They got married. They were yoked together with their mate. Both of them were unbelievers. But then somewhere down the line, one of them became a believer. And because one of them became a believer, man, it brought all kind of issues into the household. It brought all kind of issues into the family. Why? Because as the Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? And so now here you used to agree like, hey, hey, living for the weekend. Yeah, we're going to party hardy. We're going to go over here and we're going to do this and we're going to do all these things. So you and your mate, man, y'all traveling, y'all party, and y'all doing all of those different things. But then now one of them gets saved. And the other one's saying, come on, baby, come on, we're going to Vegas this weekend. In fact, it's a three-day weekend. Woo, let's go. The other party, Vegas. Now they're having a prayer vigil down at the church. And I want to go pray all weekend. And they go, what? (laughs) You want to do what? And when these type of things keep happening, the non-believing get to the point of just going, you're not the person I married. You're not the person I married. You're not the person I fell in love with. So you know what? I'm out. And so it says here, if they decide that they want to leave, then the believer is to let them leave. Now that doesn't mean that you help them leave. That does not mean that, you know, oh, pastor said if they want to leave, let them leave. So let me help them. And you start pointing out every little thing that they say or that they do is wrong. And you left a toilet seat up and you did this and you did this and you become a nag or a hag or a bag. You know, you just no fun. You just nagging. 
You know, in fact, you want them gone so bad, you go and you sign them up for a dating service. No. It says if they want to leave, let them leave. But again, we are not to push them. But also understand something. Even though they leave, that doesn't mean that you're free to go do whatever you want to do. You're a Christian. And in God's eyesight, the only reason for divorce is infidelity. So now, if they leave, right, you cannot go out and start dating. I've seen people in the church do that. You know, I look up and I see somebody and I know they're married or whatever, and I know they're having trouble or whatever, and they separate. And then they think that because they're separate, they start dating. I've seen even people bring the new person to church. And I'm going, uh, excuse me? You're still married. Yeah, but we're separated and we're talking about getting a divorce. That's way over there. Right now, you're still married. And as a married woman, as a married man, as a Christian married person, you are to honor the Lord. You're asking God to bless you, but yet you're going into a relationship. You're going in things crossways. And see, please understand that, people. Because we do it a lot. We ask God to bless us in our thing when we make, and we're not making our thing God's thing. You know, there's many times when, you know, the, the, uh, you know in, in a marriage, one person is saying, God, 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 you know, I, I really want you to speak to my husband. I really want you to speak to my wife. And, and God is saying to that husband, husband, go and love your wife. It's Christ loved the church. Well, I love her you know, if, if she honors me. But God, I want you to bless. But you're not doing what God asked you to do. You, you want God to bless you in your disobedience. And guess what? He's not going to do it. And so he gives us the instructions. And all of these instructions are laid out so that we can have hope. And so he says again, if you're in a relationship, you're in a marriage, here you got into this marriage, both of you were yoked together as unbelievers. But then now one becomes a believer. And because of that, man, it causes trouble. It says if they want to leave, go ahead and let them leave. But again, you are to still follow the Lord. And when you follow the Lord, the Lord will bless you and honor you. See, what we have to understand is this. And we're almost done. And that is that the Lord takes marriage very, very seriously. God takes marriage very, very seriously. And God takes marriage so seriously because, again, he knows it is the foundation for the family life. In a strong marriage, you can have a family life, a solid family life that can be passed down from generation to generation. And so God takes that seriously. And so therefore, he wants us to take that seriously. And we do here at Calvary Chapel. That's why we refuse. We refuse to marry anybody without going through premarital counseling. It's not for us to tell you what you need to do, but it's for us to tell you this is what God is expecting of you. You understand this, right? When you get up in front of the church, you're saying I do to him more than you are sold to each other. So, Mr. Man, this is what God is expecting of you. Miss Ma'am, this is what God is expecting of you. Now, let's open up this baggage that everybody is bringing into this relationship and everybody got baggage. Amen. So we open up the bag and show all of the junk. Man, dude, you see all this stuff this girl got? Lady, you see all this stuff this man got? Yeah. And you still want to marry him? Yes. You still want to marry her? Yes. Okay. So you go into this thing with your eyes wide open and you know what God is expecting of you and how you are to operate, how you are to conduct yourself. Yes. Okay. So now we can go forward. But until then, no, God takes marriage so seriously. The Bible actually says that God hates divorce. And here's why he hates divorce. Because of all of the pain 
And because of all of the suffering that it causes to everybody who's in fall. I don't know if you've ever been divorced. I don't know if you ever know anybody who's been divorced. There's a lot of pain in there. There's a lot of suffering in there. And the suffering is not just between the husband and the wife. If there's kids in there, they suffer, the in-laws suffer, everybody who's involved in that suffers. There's marriages where they split apart and now this, this child is not speaking to this parent and this parent is not speaking to this child and that's just pain and it's just suffering. Everybody gets ripped apart. And because God loves us, he hates to see us get ripped up. Like I say again, these instructions are not to make us better. These instructions are to make us better. And so God says when it comes to marriage, move slow. Move slow. And here are the criteria that you must uh, uh, adhere to when you're going in. But again, when it came down to again to, to the unbeliever, God says, don't leave that woman. Don't leave that man just because they are a, a non-believer. Last thing, and I hope you caught this part, where it says that the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the believing wife. And the believing wife, I mean, in, in the uh, in other way around, the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Now, the word that's used there for holy does not mean holy as we would think of the word holy, meaning pure or morally excellent. That's not what it means. What it actually means is sanctified. Sanctified. Some of your Bibles actually use the word sanctified. And what does the word sanctified mean? It means set aside, set apart. And so in this situation, what it means is this. It means that the unsaved person, because they are married to a saved person, they are sanctified or they are set aside to see the work of God up close and personal. Are you hearing me? If you're listening, say amen. What it means is, again, when you have a person who is saved, and they are married to an unsaved person. The unsaved person is set aside. The unsaved person is sanctified. They're set apart to see the work of God in an un- uh, up-close and personal way. How do they see it? Through their mate. When they see their mate living as unto the Lord, they're going, that is not the girl I married. Man, she is so sweet. She is so kind. She is so gracious. Man, that is not the guy that I married. Look how hard he works. Look how diligent he is to, to take care of his family. That has happened since that Jesus thing. And as the more that that saved person is blessed, the more the unsaved person sees the blessings and also can benefit from the blessings. For example, if you have a person again who is, you know, they're saved now and they're doing it as unto the Lord, right? And they go out and they start a business and God begins to bless that business. Man, the unsaved person who is married to them is going to benefit from the blessings from the business. Amen? So they're set aside and then they're going, wow, God is blessing them like this and God is blessing them like that. I worked for a company years ago where the majority of the people, we were salesmen, and the majority of the people in the company were Christians. And as God was blessing the Christians as we're out doing our sales, the company was blessed because of us. So that's what it's talking about. We're set aside to see the work of God. So God says, don't just automatically divorce them. 
I know sometimes the Lord says in that situation, man, they're getting on your nerve or sometimes they are, they are headache and they are heartache and I know you want to get away from them. But the Lord says, just honor me. Honor me in that and watch me work and watch me illuminate my work in their eyes through you. I'm going to give you a, a word of encouragement. How many of you ever heard of Tony Evans? You ever everybody ever heard of Tony Evans? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you don't know Tony, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> Tony is one of my favorite Bible teachers. And Tony tells this story that how uh, when he was coming up, he was in an unsaved household. But then one day, his father got saved. And when his father got saved, he said his mother just made it her business to push that man's buttons as much as she could. She was pushing every button she was just making his life miserable. And he says the more that his wife, his mother did that to his dad, the more his dad loved her. And she's just pushing him, pushing him pushing, and she's just trying to get a rise out of him. And ladies, you know what I'm talking about. And she's trying to get a rise out of him, but instead of him fighting back, he just kept loving her and loving her and loving her, you know. And after, you know, over a year or so, finally she gave up. She's like, what is this? What is this? It has taken a hold of you. I have been making your life a pure hell. And you're loving me more and more and more. What did he do? He actually loved the hell out of her. (laughs) Yes! He loved the hell out of her. And she became a Christian. And because he was a Christian and she was a Christian and Tony is looking at this, Tony became a Christian. And the rest is history. And so when you're, so if you're in a relationship, and again, I know some of you are, where you got saved after you got married, and part of you was just going, man, I need to, I need to get out of here. I need to, you know, for the sake of my children, I need to get away from this heathen. God is saying, just be still. Now, we know that there are sometimes, as I said before, you know, when it might get to the point again where they're not taking care of the household, they're physically abusing or verbally abusing or whatever, and you have to separate, you know. But again, if it's to the point where if it's, you know, again, it's, it's cordial, it might not be perfect. But again, if they want to stay with you and they're still treating you right, he says, stay there. Stay there and let the glory of the Lord rise upon you. He says, and watch and see, watch and see. And only will they many times come to faith because each person has to come on their own. Many times, again, that carries on and goes down to your household. Amen? Amen. And so, again, the Lord writes these things so that we can have hope. We can have hope in the midst of all of the different crazy things that's going on. So I pray again that you would take these instructions and walk them out in your life. Let's close with this. Let me give you some things to remember from today's study. Number one, and that is that God hates divorce. And why does he hate divorce? Because of all of the suffering that it causes people. Sometimes people think God just hates divorce just because he hates divorce. No, God doesn't want to see you get ripped up. God hates it when he sees your family just falling apart and in pieces. God hates divorce because of the pain it causes everybody who is involved. Number two, being saved after being married does not break the marriage bond. It should make it stronger. Being saved after being married does not break the marriage bond. It should make it stronger.
And number three, when a non-believer is married to a believer, they get to see God working up close. They get to see God working up close. And this week's challenge is this. That is to tell somebody about the good plans that God has for their life. Tell somebody about the good plans that God has for their lives. He has ears. Let him hear what the Spirit would have to say.